I'm Chris Harding, the Director for Interoperability at the Open Group, and this is the first webinar in our series on SOA in the digital age. The series will cover the use of SOA in modern enterprises that use digital technologies such as cloud, mobile and social computing, big data analytics and the Internet of Things. And in this first webinar, Developments in SOA, we'll look at how SOA has evolved to meet today's needs. So it first came to prominence in 2005, although it had been adopted by a few companies even before then. So it's now 10 years old, and 10 years is a long time for a technical approach to last. In its early stages, uh, SOA was a bit like the Wright Brothers aeroplane, brilliant in concept, uh, but somewhat lacking in te technical maturity. Uh, our panel is going to discuss how SOA has evolved. Uh, John Bell, an independent consultant and chair of the IEEE SOA and Web Services Working Group, and E.G. Nadan, uh, who is a distinguished technologist and lead technologist for global strategic capabilities in enterprise services, um, brackets applications, at HP. I'm going to moderate the discussion and ask the first set of questions. Uh, when they've discussed these, the panel will take questions from the audience. So I'd like to start by asking, what were the original key concepts of SOA? Uh, this is Nathan. So um, basically, when going back um, many years now, when service-oriented architecture concepts started, the challenge we had then was integration between multiple applications, multiple technologies, and each one um, having proprietary interfaces. And the, one of the key uh, challenges um, that we wanted to address then was interoperability and the services-oriented approach. Um, what that brought forth was the ability to interact, the ability to interface between two applications in a standardized manner where the underlying technology and how the content was being delivered and shared really became, uh, you know, it was uh, encapsulated behind the scenes so that the parties who were actually interacting with each other could focus on the business at hand. So those were, um, you know, well, that's what comes to mind first. But, John, please go ahead. Yeah, so many, many years ago I worked on a project for a uh, – major manufacturer of agricultural equipment. <clears throat> the problem we had to solve was they had a lot of information that was stored on various collections of mainframes, mini computers, and everybody talked a different protocol. But because the web had become so popular, everybody, every one of these systems had an HTTP server. And we were able to write scripts that extracted the data that was needed to be exchanged with other systems convert it into HTML in a standardized HTML format that we had agreed on and transform and transmit information between the systems. An early example of web services. Eventually HTML got replaced with XML. Uh, <clears throat> all of these things happened and it created essentially a web service a web service model. If you look at Microsoft technologies, Microsoft had a technology called DDE for dynamic data exchange. And somebody at Microsoft had a great idea, hey, why don't we stub out DDE on the computer so that it makes a network call and sends that information over to another computer and then it won't know that the DDE service it's calling is actually on a different computer. And it, again, traveled over the network. The beauty of the services-oriented architecture is you think about this from a networked distributed processing model in the beginning and it and and you can use it for helping with your integration but you can also use it to create better software architectures okay so thanks uh, John and Nadan the idea of uh, interfaces between applications done in a standardized manner which enables people to focus on the the business aspects using uh, the, the a web services based approach or an approach uh, that has evolved from um, from web services 
uh, looks like the, the core to SOA. John, can I ask you the next question? Because you were uh, involved not so much from a provider, but from a user aspect in some of those early days. You were in the uh, hotel industry, I believe, using SOA to uh, to, to in, in an enterprise architecture and solution architecture context. Can you say something about how SOA worked in practical enterprise and solution architectures? Yeah, so in the early days, uh, SOA, <clears throat> when we recognized it as being a SOA architecture, and so I'm skipping CORBA here because many people did not think of CORBA as a SOA architecture, but when we recognized it, as a SOA architecture is really taking XML and leveraging XML over the rest of the resources that were provided with the World Wide Web. That's the HTTP protocol uh, and the, um, the messaging that goes along with the HTTP pr protocol. Uh, I remember the early days of XML RPC. If you look at industries like the hotel industry, uh, because there was a need to integrate with online travel agencies, uh, so that they could get the information about your hotels, the availability, the room types, all the information about a hotel to make a reservation, the industry created a standard set of XML documents to exchange to get this kind of information. In those early days, that's what it was all about. Uh, it was about creating an XML document and exchanging those XML documents, uh, creating services that essentially gave you the ability to query for a specific XML document and return that XML document. That was very effective, but it had limitations when you wanted to move, you wanted to take these messages and you wanted to handle them in infrastructure that was not HTTP based, not web oriented. Uh, so that's why the initial involvement in the uh, initial evolution from technologies like XML RPC uh, and just simple XML over HTTP uh, evolved into things like SOAP. Okay, and did did you find that doing that um, helped you to deliver value in business terms to to enable the um, hotels, for example, to give better services to their customers? So imagine a hotel having to integrate with Expedia, with Hotels.com, with uh, uh, Orbitz, with all these many, many travel agencies. If there were a standard, it would be a one-off for integration with each one of these travel with each one of these online travel agencies, uh, because of the standards, because of the ability to use services and deploy and publish that information in a standardized fashion. The cost for the hotel industry and the cost for the online travel agencies greatly reduced because the integration now becomes standard uh, and it's low cost tools, things that are easy, uh, relatively easy for both sides to implement. And that it made a huge difference in the, in the hospitality industry. Great. So that's a great example of um, delivering business value through ease of integration. Um, through a flexible approach to standard interfaces. Can I add on to that, that of question, course. Chris? Yes. Okay. Yep. Well, what I find interesting about that, that question is um, initially, when the, during the beginning days, uh, even years uh, of SOA, there was this misconception that just because you are using web services, just because you are you know, going HTTP, um, you have a service oriented architecture in place. And it took some time for enterprises to mature and understand that you need an architecture around the services in the first place. So when that realization set in, there was also this um, perceived conflict between enterprise and service-oriented architecture and overlaps and so on. So um, the example that, or the real life scenario that John spoke to um, we real, started realizing such winning solutions when that level of maturity set in that, yes, enterprises need a service-oriented approach. They need a service-oriented architecture, and that actually facilitated the supply chain integration a great deal. 
because partners realized, you know, why bother doing uh, what somebody else is already doing? Instead, they can focus on their core competencies by leveraging what is available through partnerships and through other service providers. So just wanted to share that on top of the excellent uh, thoughts that uh, John shared, Chris. Okay, thanks, Nathan. That's a, that's a great addition to, to, to John's answer. Okay, can we move then on to the next question? And can I ask you, um, and perhaps John will want to comment on this uh, afterwards, what impact cloud and other new technologies have had on SOA? Yes, so uh, the advent of cloud is actually, it's almost as if, you know, if enterprise IT rewound and we came up with uh, a plan, okay, let's come up with client server first and multi-tier and then, you know, services. It's all, it almost seems like it was a plan. Somebody was orchestrating it, not me. But my point is that, you know, SOA was the, the right precedent for setting in uh, the evolution to the cloud. So what happened is, you know, because cloud is all about, you know, utilization of, uh, you know, underutilized resources and also making, uh, you know, availability of uh, service providers uh, across the firewalls and um, the, the core service-oriented foundation that existed within the enterprise now started getting exposure also at the infrastructure level. Um, Service-oriented architecture was initially focused primarily on applications, but when uh, cloud came in, that exposed and expanded the presence of SOA into infrastructure. And um, the open group actually led the way, I would say, in defining the first technical standard for the service-oriented cloud computing infrastructure, which in initially started with a service-oriented infrastructure project, but the timing was such that cloud was also getting the same visibility and it became very clear that there is a very um, you know, good intersection between the two. So the fundamental impact that cloud has had over SOA is its evolutionary presence in the infrastructure layer in addition to its foundational presence in applications. And the interesting aspect here is the fundamental principles of SOA even though rooted in applications and definitely having that business perspective that that could be applied in infrastructure, which may not have happened as quickly had cloud not come about. So I look at this in that cloud wouldn't exist today if we hadn't already created services-oriented architectures. Uh, cloud needed more than services-oriented architectures but cloud today is built on services-oriented architecture. Uh, if you think about it, from a, a conceptual standpoint, without taking the network out of the equation here, <clears throat> Unix pr provides basically five interfaces to any device it connects to. It abstracts the devices out with open, close, read, write, and I.O. control. So think of those as the five key services. Now, if I can create a web service or a network service that exposes those five key services on a different machine and then use a web protocol to talk to that machine, I've achieved a distributed, a level of distributed computing. And if I treat that as if it were, say, a disk file system, now all of a sudden I've got a network file system that I can expose as a service. Uh, so it's taking that combination of having those standardized interfaces and that inexpensive way of communicating over the net because we did this before services-oriented architectures. Uh, the problem was it was expensive and complex. What SOA did was it simplified those interfaces. And that's where I see if we hadn't have done that, if we hadn't have gotten to that point, uh, and then combined with other technologies such as virtualization uh, so that we can dynamically allocate uh, virtual CPUs and virtual storage and those types of things, we wouldn't have cloud. So if the cloud is uh, built on web services and it's built on other technologies like the virtualization capabilities and that type of thing. Okay, so it sounds like you're agreed not so much the um, impact that cloud has had on SOA, uh, but more that cloud would not have been possible without SOA and that SOA has been an enabler for cloud people were saying initially was that it was very expensive to uh, set up an SOA 
uh, environment because of the, um, the the infrastructure that you needed to make it work. Um, would you say that that was 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 true? And can I can I ask you first, John, how have uh, SOA tooling and infrastructure evolved? So SOA started off actually being very cheap. Uh, it was essentially you needed to know and understand XML. You needed to know and understand HTTP. You use the same tools that you had available to you, your text editors, those types of things, uh, and it made services very cheap. But as the requirements, the needs for doing integration came along, services became more expensive. SOAP added a huge amount of complexity. That complexity came with a lot of value, but it also came with a lot of additional, it also came with a lot of additional costs and a lot of additional complexity. Uh, it's great for solving enterprise kinds of problems, but when they did that, they lost the original value of the simplicity of the early solutions, the XML over HTTP, the XML RPC type solutions. They lost the, the elegance, the simplicity, and the beauty, and with it, they brought a lot of power, but a lot of complexity and a lot of expense, but things that are hard to do without that. So today, what you're seeing is you're seeing that pushback against that cost, against that complexity, uh, and a move towards simplifying. And some of that is an underlying model, the RESTful model for how you access, you virtually access the data. Uh, the underlying uh, the underlying information that you need or provide the business services that you're expecting uh, to provide. Some of it is with the representation using JSON instead of XML. Uh, JSON is considerably simpler, easier to parse. Some of it is due to the languages and tools that developers are using today. So if you're using a full-featured language like a C++, a C Sharp, or a Java, uh, you there are very powerful libraries that exist to handle a lot of the complexity for the developer. But if you're using a language like PHP 5, uh, uh, I'd argue JavaScript, uh, uh, Ruby, uh, Python, these languages don't have the depth and richness of, of libraries supporting them uh, that some of these other environments have. And so there's a preference to go with something that's easier for the developer to implement, easier for the developer to understand. When you look at the developers that are coming out of college today, very few of them have training in SOAP. Very few of them have training in the, uh, the types of technologies that were popular five years ago. Now they're looking at REST and JSON and JavaScript and those types of things. Okay, would you like to uh, to add to that, uh, Nathan? Sure, so I would talk about the tooling first and the infrastructure next. Um, what's interesting about SOA tooling is um, it, in the beginning stages, um, more and more vendors uh, started, you know, whether it be IDEs or testing tools, um, from a development perspective, from an apps development perspective, talk to the vendor, they would say, well, we can generate web services, we can go so on. And that became kind of the mantra, and I was afraid the next time I walked into a coffee shop, the barista is gonna tell me that we are going so as well, have gone so on. But what, you know, it, later, um, after the proliferation of web services and the service-oriented concepts, the realization that we need tools in an entirely, uh, you know, unexpected domain. It was, you know, a, a late realization. And I'm talking about web services management. I'm talking about policy enforcement. I'm talking about provisioning. I'm talking about tracking metrics. So these are all uh, things that dawned on enterprises after the fact. It was not exactly a planned approach where, you know, uh, the uh, you know the powers that be that uh, you know decided we will have the tools for development and management and operations and governance and so on. That's not how it worked out. The tools actually came first for development, and after the mess was created, to be quite honest, then the realization came: Oh my God, we need tools in this space too. So there was a maturity that we went through as enterprise IT where initially there was, uh, you know, the vendors caught up for development 
and then they play catch up to uh, provision tools and make sure that we can orchestrate the services, manage the services, provision and enforce policies and governance and so on. So in recent years, in the recent past, there has been more of an evolution in that domain compared to decades back when we had the you know, introduction of SOA tools. So that's on the tooling side. Uh, as far as infrastructure goes, really this idea that infrastructure can be availed as a service, just like you can access applications, you have you know, interfaces to applications, um, has actually, you know, um, that, that is how SOA has uh, had an impact. And therefore, the fact that application designers, application architects have to factor in the infrastructure being available as a service when they look at the complete universe of services, keeping a service-oriented approach in mind, is also forcing infrastructure to present itself, avail, you know, make sure that it is available to the application team in that manner. So there is a bi-directional growth of the awareness on the role that services has when the application team consumes the infrastructure provided. Can I ask particularly about the Enterprise Services Bus, ESB, because um, when in the early days there were a lot of people who actually equated SOA to ESBs. The purists said, no, no, ESB is just a tool, um, SOA is a, is a philosophy. Uh, but there were people who said, well, all you need to do to implement SOA is you go out and buy one of these things. Um, but uh, I get the feeling that we're rather moving away from that uh, with the, the move towards REST. Um, so, so are ESBs, are, are they still relevant? Have they evolved? Have they changed? So uh, I'd like to, to take that on initially, uh, if you don't mind. I have a... Uh, uh, I have used ESP in a number of different environments. I have customers now that I'm actually recommending uh, integrate USBs or ESBs inside their environments. Uh, you know, the the way I look at REST is if I'm connecting to the outside world, a RESTful solution is a really good way to do it. But when I have a lot of different things that are going on internally in the company, uh, in order to build that RESTful model, in order to create those messages that have the information from multiple systems that are needed in order to generate that, that particular uh, service response, uh, I need to be able to integrate information from multiple different systems, and an ESB with its orchestration capability is a great way of doing that. Uh, at the hotel company that I worked at for many years, uh, we had internal message structures that were optimized for the information we needed to move between our systems. We integrated with our outside partners through the web using the Open Travel Alliance and HTNG, which is a, another set of standards in the hotel industry, uh, which I'm actively involved in. Uh, using those messages, in order to do that, Rather than writing new services that expose these different messages, we transformed our internal message into these external messages. Uh, and in some cases, we'd get a company like Google, which says, hey, we're big enough, we don't care about standards, write it the way we want it. And instead of having to create a new service, all we had to do was a new transformation on the existing service. So when the request came in from that channel, uh, that transformation was done. Uh, that transformation was done specifically for the unique needs of that particular partner. Uh, the beauty of this is it dramatically lowered our cost for integration with the many partners that we had to integrate with, even though we didn't ha take on the problem internally of having to have all of our messages limited to what that standard message to what those standard message formats. Uh, look like. We didn't have to go with the least common denominator. We could go with the richness of the message that we needed for our internal services and then go with the standardization for uh, interfacing with our external partners. Uh, that's These are just a couple of things that the ESB does, but the real killer solution for an ESB 
is until we had an ESD, all of our integrations were point to point. So uh, when I worked with uh, the website for that hotel company, and I'm sure many people on the phone call have used that website, uh, it had to integrate with our central reservation system and initially it directly connected to the central reservation system. It had to integrate with the system that managed hotel folios and initially that was a direct integration. Eventually as we put an ESB in place, uh, that integration no longer went point to point to that system. It went now to our ESB and the ESB figured out how to route the messages. <clears throat> and the beauty of it was when we changed where that message was being serviced from, the client didn't need to know. All the client had to do was hit the same endpoint on the ESB. The ESB would say, oh, I have a new target for this message, and it would redirect the target. The other thing is a great pattern for doing uh, enforcement of security. All of the security, uh, we, we actually used an, uh, two ESBs, one for the outside world, one for the inside world, and all the security enforcement was done at those ESPs in terms of uh, making sure authentication, credentials, those types of things were provided with the message. So does ESB have a place in today's modern uh, SOA architectures? I think yes, but typically the ESB is going to be something that's uh, more for how you're going to integrate your backend systems to expose this facade, uh, which may be a restful facade to the outside world. Does that make sense? That's a, that's a pretty comprehensive answer. Uh, do, you, do you want to add to it, Nathan? Yes, not, not much, but um, I would say that uh, see, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. We live in a world where there are varied levels of complexity, the need for control, policy enforcement, governance, it varies. So ESB, at the end of the day, is more an enabler to enforce the right levels of control and structure, whereas REST offers you the flexibility that today's uh, teams crave for. And if it works in the context of the enterprise for what you want to do, you have to pick the solution that best meets your needs. And I am a purist, Chris, for the record. I do not believe that just because you have ESB, you can go so effectively. You do need that appropriate processes, governance structure in place to use ESB right. The presence of the ESB does not automatically make the enterprise so compliant, so to speak. So that's all I wanted to add, Chris. Yeah, I'm, I'm a purist as well. I'm a purist as well <laughs> in case I forgot to put that in. Yep. <laughs> Well, thanks, Adam. I think you've reinforced the need, whatever you do, for thinking about it and for um, for, for, for an architectural approach, um, whether it's service-oriented or any other kind of architecture, but particularly if it's a service-oriented architecture, the tools, the technology doesn't make the um, make the solution. Um, if, I'm conscious right. If you have if you have the problem that an ESB solves. Uh, yeah. ESB is a great solution for that problem. If you don't have those problems, it's a waste of money and time. Oh, I'll say that's yeah. the code of the day so far. Yeah. Okay, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty good quote. Uh, we've looked a bit at the underlying technology and infrastructure. Can we maybe look at how SOA architecture and development practices have evolved? Sure. So. Like I said um, earlier, the, um, when, when the concept of service-oriented architecture set in, and when the need for services to be identified in the business context, for business to drive services, and only then we even talk about how those services are to be technologically enabled there was significant overlap perceived between enterprise architecture and service-oriented architecture. So the way it has evolved is to work hand-in-hand -hand with enterprise architecture and make sure that the goals are continuing to be realized but keeping the broader enterprise context in mind. And I would also say that there is no one approach that meets all enterprises' needs. 
each enterprise must take a look at, you know, how SOA best works for itself. So there is that flexibility, you know, how do you address SOA, how do you adopt SOA in the context of enterprise, in the, your enterprise, it allows you that flexibility. So it evolved from the perspective of enterprise architecture and also to a point where enterprises have that flexibility to do what is right for them. It has also crept into, or uh, now is more comprehensive, not just for applications. It also applies to the different, um, uh, you know, the, the infrastructure layers as well. So those are two uh, key areas how SOA architecture has evolved. As far as development practices go, the, um, the, the, the way that applications development teams think has been greatly impacted because of SOA. So now it is more about and has been for some time uh, to you know, ensure that whatever we are building, that in, it can actually integrate to the next partner who comes along, to the next application that wants to you know, interface with us. There is a more proactive urge to be compliant with standards, if not define standards, and make sure that you know, interoperability is addressed from the get-go rather than, you know, we are proprietary and therefore we are right type of approach from a, a development standpoint. And just to reiterate a point I made earlier, the application development teams are no longer just looking at, you know, what it takes to build and deploy the application. In fact, there is a significant focus on deployment so that there is, uh, you know, how will we consume the infrastructure services? How um, how can we make sure that we factor in those design considerations early on so that we can avail the services being provisioned in a more effective manner? So those are some of the thoughts that come to my mind, Chris. Okay. Thanks, Nadim. John, do you have any any additions to that? Yeah, I, I have a couple of observations. One is when you're looking – so, so is the style of architecture. When you're looking at an enterprise architecture, you need to look at what are the services I need that reflect my business services. So if I'm operating a hotel, I need to be able to create, retrieve, update a reservation. I can't delete a reservation. They can be canceled, but they can't be deleted. Uh, I need to be able to find uh, available hotels. These are core business functions I'm exposing as services. But when I come to creating a user-facing application, now all of a sudden what I'm presenting to the user in that user interface uh, is a collection of information that may take several services and pieces from the responses to those services in order to build what I'm presenting to the user. This is, uh, so at, at some point I'm doing some form of orchestration, whether I'm doing it, say, in a mobile device or if I'm doing it in a different layer of middleware, I'm doing something that's specific and unique for the user experience on that application. But if I think of that in terms of what are the services I'm going to offer for that application, now I'm looking at services-oriented architecture at the application level, not at the enterprise level. And that's the thing that I see as a big difference today. Services-oriented architecture was really came about as a need to to do applications, and then it started being applied uh, as a way of exposing the the business needs of the the uh, the enterprise. Now I see it as being both, but you used potentially different infrastructure, potentially different services. One set of services is typically long lived because business. Uh, services typically do not change with an industry very quickly. The others are very short-lived, reflecting what you need to expose to that end user. Okay. And can we move on and specifically look at, uh, at microservices? And in fact, uh, there are some questions coming in from the audience. Uh, Raghavan uh, Velan Coyle has asked what is microservices and its impact to SOA. And uh, Jadeep Chadha has asked uh, how do you think SOA would evolve in future in a federated enterprise where microservices and cloud are a given? So um, 
can we maybe touch on both of those questions? Are, are microservices the future of SOA, or are they sort of kind of an interesting um, side shoot that might uh, might not be part of the main course of, of SOA? Uh, anyone want to take me first on that one? I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and volunteer since I've been very vocal in the MSA group on this. Uh, microservices architecture are a subset of a full SOA architecture, so it is uh, it's a SOA architecture with certain design constraints uh, on it. So I don't see Mike, I don't see MSA and SOA architecture uh, as being uh, different as being different things, uh, other than one's a subset of the other. The other piece with uh, with MSA is that um, <coughs> uh, MSA is part of part of what I was referring to uh, earlier in the discussion when I talked about that need for simplification. When you see a lot of MSAs, they're implemented specifically to expose APIs, uh, and they represent that simplify that need to do a simplified implementation, uh, for, both for deployment and for uh, for operationals for a number of reasons. Uh, and so uh, if I'm putting in a new system, whether it's custom built or off or off the shelf and it's got a uh, MSA uh, implementation to expose an API for that system, uh, while the API for that system will typically not be exposed through an ESB in this case, I might use it to through an ESP in order to create more complex services by combining the, MS, the MSA implemented services. Uh, when you look at a cloud environment where you're dynamically allocating, uh, where you're dynamically allocating resources, uh, it becomes very important to be able to do these types of things. So that's that's the way I, that's the way I look at an MSA. As a, as a part of so. Uh, Nathan, is, is, is this something you'd, you'd like to to expand on, or um, or do you I would to... say uh, very quickly, I would say that the, you know when SOA originally started, it was okay. Here is an application, and then we need to interface and expose <laughs> services, consume services, and so on. Microservices has introduced the interesting concept of even within. The application can is composed of many microservices, so your you know even the application is born because of a combination of multiple microservices. So it's more the component-based approach where you are bringing together multiple components to form the application in the first place. So that's all. Uh, that's all I would add, Chris. Yeah. So the the other discussion that came out was that uh, when you look at the reading on MSA. Uh, MSA, a lot of the discussion in the reading is really about, well, MSA does this, but really what we're saying is that MSA, if you're practicing MSA the way it's described, uh, is SOA done right on a small level, on a small scale. Sounds like a good definition, SOA done right on a small scale. I think we've, we've touched on SOAP versus REST. Uh, we've certainly, uh, we certainly touched on microservices. Um, so unless either of you want to to uh, to expand on those uh, any further, maybe we can move into more of the the questions that have have, have been coming up. Is is, is that okay, um, John and, and Nathan? The one thing I want to add with SOAP versus REST is it is possible to use SOAP in a RESTful style, uh, and uh, REST is not does not have to be tied to HTTP, and it is possible to use SOAP RESTfully. I think that's a very good point, that REST is not as such a protocol, it's a philosophy, as I understand it anyway. Right. Um, and as you say, it could be used with SOAP uh, or other protocols. Um, okay, um, can we move on then? There are a number of interesting questions here. Um, and I'm not going to take them in any particular order, uh, but perhaps I could go to one that's asked by Cesar uh, Mercado. How do other digital enablers, such as mobility, social, big data, and analytics, and the Internet of Things, affect SOA? Um, Nadine, perhaps? You want to try sure. That one? So, 
Sure. So um, in all those areas, especially when it comes to Internet of Things, um, mobility, um, and so on, the the need for exchanging information in a timely manner, the need for exchanging data in a timely manner, and then realizing value out of that data is what you know uh, big data and taking action based upon the insight gained is really what big data is all about. And the Internet of Things is just expanding the universe of uh, data sources. The reason why I laid that context first is because the need for interoperability has only uh, been exponentially increased, um, which is something, uh, one of the fundamental concepts enabled by SOA. So um, I would say the impact that SOA has had is really in channeling and you know growing that fundamental thought process, the need to interact, interface, and exchange data in a timely manner, whether it be mobility, whether it be IoT, or you know, big data, social media, and so on, um, that need has only been accentuated. So SOA is uh, definitely a foundation that has taken us there um, and, 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 and continues to do so from a conceptual standpoint. So I, I look at IoT as being a classic example of, of where SOA can be a big winner. Uh, think of a small device, and I'll, I'll use a thermostat as, as an example. A hotel, you know, a hotel with 250 rooms typically has 300 thermostats in the hotel, one for each room and, and several over common areas. And they tend to want to manage these in a central location. You, want, you don't want to have to go visit each room to change the, the thermostat, and you don't want to have to go to the room to find out the room's too hot or too cold for the guest. Uh, so the question then becomes, do you have that thermostat send a message periodically to a service that's listening for that message? Or do you query that thermostat when you want to find the temperature of the room? If nobody's staying in the room, do you really care? Uh, and these kinds of things, you know, the beauty of web services, they give you the flexibility to change the architecture according to what your needs are for that particular, uh, for that particular solution. And this is where the real power for IoT, uh, for IoT and web services comes in is you can do that integration, but you can do that integration using an event style system, using a polling style system with the, the device being the source or the device being the the endpoint, the uh, the uh, uh, the requester, it's you know it allows you to have a lot of flexibility with how you do this integration using a very small set of rules, and that's that's where I see the power for so in this in this context is. Okay, um, can we maybe take another question uh, from Shayla Sahoni? Um, how do you see SOA servicing its business use case, especially in big data environment? Uh, you may have structured, non-structured data in multi-terabyte size. I am really concerned whether SOA can help um, servicing the data needed in this use case. Can you comment on, on the, the value of a service-oriented approach when the size or velocity of the data it is dealing with is, is enormous. Uh, let me, let me, there are a couple of solutions. Again, this is something that I see commonly in the hospitality industry, which where I support and do a lot of my work. There are a couple of solutions that are common. One is if I'm gonna look at, say, streaming, uh, streaming a video stream, uh, I need to set that up. Services are a good way of doing that setup, and then I'm going to stream directly to my uh, stream directly to my endpoint. The other thing is, don't think necessarily of a service as being something that always implements XML or always implements, uh, you know, REST and JSON and all that type of thing. When I'm streaming that data, that data's got to have some place to go. I'm setting up a, a two ends of a connection, and so that streaming is actually being handled through a service uh, that's delivering that streamed information to that 
endpoint, which is your television, your mobile device, uh, you know, that, that type of thing. Another thing, and we have to deal with this a lot in the hotel industry because for years it was traditional just to do uh, large bulk file transfers to move daily data between systems. Uh, and that's, there are a number of reasons why that is not always the most desirable way to do. And then what they do is they use a web service that, that batches uh, those bulk transfers up and basically acts as a protocol on top of the network layered protocol. Uh, in order to to batch that information up and and send it in a way that guarantees delivery, guarantees consistency, those those types of things. Uh, so, uh, big data. I'm not sure I've got a good answer for you. Uh, so, 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 so long as it's not on the granular level, but it's at the high level, um, dealing with the, the 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 direction of streams and so on, then the so so certainly it has a place. I, I think was what you were saying. Yeah. Um, do you, do, you, do you want to add to that, Nathan, briefly? Yes. So I would actually request uh, the person who asked the question and others to look at the first um, technical standard um, on the service-oriented cloud computing infrastructure from the open group. And the reason why I bring that up is because the case study that we used when uh, publishing that paper was about uploading auto-racing videos. And we have looked at, you know, doing that as a technology provider, as a service provider, using a service-oriented approach. And you will see how the alternate, the various choices um, are factored in. And to Chris, the point that Chris summarized just now, the fundamental concepts of availing various, um, you know, services has not gone away. If not anything else, big data, the need to work with structured and unstructured data has only proliferated the need to work with the right services, the right service providers. So those concepts are very much there today. So from that standpoint, SOA is a fundamental enabler and continues to be so. So I would, I would really uh, suggest you go and take a look at that too, so that you know, that will have shed some more light. But that being said, if you think of SOA as a technology solution, what we started with in the original days, uh, you know, that may not hold good as much. We have evolved. But then the concepts, though, have only been uh, reinforced and definitely apply even in the case of big data, unstructured data, um, mobility, and so on. And so when you look at big data, uh, if you're trying to retrieve a data item and, you know, think of CouchDB or, or uh, Berkeley, the, the old uh, Berkeley Sleepy Cat DB, uh, when you're trying to retrieve an item, essentially you're giving it the key, you're retrieving the item, item can come back as, I believe Couch automatically returns as a JSON object, it can come back as a, uh, uh, an XML document, it could come back as a IDL uh, object. Essentially, those large data databases for retrieving data are exposing web services. When you're talking about the operations that happen on the data, doing the the, the slicing and dicing, you know, you're you're also talking about services, but how those services get processed uh, by the requester is going to be unique uh, according to what your your application needs are. Okay, so that's. Uh... Uh, I think I think there's a lot more that could be said on this topic, but uh, we are actually drawing to the end of the hour, so let's move on. And, and can I ask you both this 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 final question? If you could say a few words briefly, do you think the the main concepts of SOA have changed? Is today's SOA fundamentally different from the original? Uh, and if so, in what big respects? I can go first. Um, so sure. the, the answer to the first question, you know, um, uh, the main concepts of SOA have not really changed. Of course, it depends on what level of abstraction you look at. But I would say, you know, fundamentally, the concepts that originated the need for SOA and what it has evolved to, those concepts have not changed. However, what has changed is that it has definitely been commoditized. 
so it is a lot more prevalent and much easily much more you know available but there is also a level of maturity that we have grown to where there is a realization that you know we need governance we need proper architectures we need uh, you know the the policy enforcement security and managing the list of services so that we have the services that are used for good business reasons rather than just creating an, a, a proliferation of services so the need for that type of governance has been uh, is has that end is there today which was not there you know in its um, you know when so originally started and cloud has actually accentuated that need so it is not just the governance around soa but also governance for cloud and just like uh, what john said earlier about you know soa is an absolute you know it was a a prerequisite for cloud i would say soa governance is actually leading up to doing cloud governance right as well so th those would be my answers uh, chris okay thanks Martin. that's a, a clear answer john do you do you have thoughts on this yeah. Yeah, I'm, I, I believe that SOA has grown up. So when you look at SOA in the early days, you know, compare it to a baby, it had a head, had two arms, two legs, and a body. Each arm and leg had, you know, ten toes, you know, five toes on each, five fingers on each hand. Uh, from that standpoint, when it's grown up, all those fundamentals are still there. It still has five fingers on each hand, five toes on each on each foot, so on and so forth. But there are different needs. Uh, now that it's grown up, you have the ability to use it as simply as it was in the beginning, but because it's grown up, it is now used for far more complex things than it was really originally imagined for. Because of that, now all of a sudden you need more governance. You've always needed some governance, but now you need more governance. You need governance that's right-sized for the problem. You want to manage that complexity. That means you want to make sure that you understand, you know, who's exposing the services, who's consuming the services, how are the services being transformed, uh, who's monitoring. Services give you insight uh, into core business processes. So from a business standpoint, now you, just like I wouldn't run a website without looking at the web logs and, and analyzing and processing the web logs. I wouldn't want to have a service-oriented architecture where I didn't have the ability to observe what was going on with my services. Uh, you know, all of these things, because of this, the increased size and complexity, have added uh, have added that these needs into that environment. Even if you have the pushback, those needs are now being done in different ways, but they're still being satisfied. So yes, it's changed, but the core concepts, I've got a standard way of, inter of interfacing, I have a standard message, I've agreed on what the message is going to be on the, the consumer and the provider side. I can do that exchange, uh, I can make a request, I can get a response, or I can, make a re I can make a request and I know that that endpoint is going to do something with it whether I hear back or not. Those things are fundamental and they have not changed. But there's, the services have grown up, so it has grown up, and with that becomes the responsibility of an adult. Okay, so I think from both of you, there's a, a feeling that uh, uh, so has uh, so has not changed fundamentally. Uh, it has become more technically mature. Maybe from we haven't uh, haven't reached the the technical advancement of the space shuttle yet, but we're probably up to the 747, something like that. Um, it's a, a robust, useful technology. There have been some great discussion in this webinar. This was the first of the series, developments in SOA, where we've really looked at how SOA has changed to now. Uh, I would like to conclude the webinar. I'd like to thank our two panelists, um, John Bell and, and, and Madden, and uh, apologies that uh, Ali could not be with us. Uh, and to everybody who asked questions, there are a huge number of questions, uh, and also actually some people have answered them on the chat. Uh, so thanks to everybody who asked those questions, who provided answers, and to everyone who participated, uh, as well as our two panelists. And I look forward to seeing you all again in our next SOA in the Digital Age webinar on the ISO SOA reference architecture.